Welcome. I'm John A. Warnick, founder of the Purposeful Planning Institute. We're excited you're joining us for a PPI Thought Leader and Industry Innovator webinar. I hope you agree with the mindset of the PPI community that our best days lie just ahead of us. To get to where we want to go, we must cultivate a beginner's mind and pursue the path of mastery, not just expertise. Our PPI Thought Leader and Industry Innovator webinars help illuminate more meaningful and powerful ways in which we serve and can grow our practices. Each webinar helps us connect, engage, learn, and inspire. If you've not already taken the bold step of joining the Purposeful Planning Institute, we hope you'll do so soon. Visit our website for additional information. And for you, our guests, and for all the incredibly talented and compassionate members of the PPI community, we remind you these recordings are intended for the use and benefit of our members and guests and sharing webinar recordings and links without express permission from PPI is prohibited. Enjoy and thrive. All right, well, welcome everyone. And thank you all for joining us for today's Thought Leader and Industry Innovator webinar. Our guest speaker today is Josh Barron co-founder and partner at Banyan Global. And our moderators today are Kristen Kepler and Kirby Rossblock. And I have a purposeful quote I'd like to share before I turn it over to Kristen and Kirby to get us started. Our quote today is by Kimberly Bythway and Diane Loveridge, authors of Traditions, Creating Memories to Draw Your Family Close. Mm. We feel that happy families don't just happen by accident or luck, they are created. Just because people are related to each other doesn't mean that they have good relationships. Those bonds have to be forged through hours spent together in meaningful activities and traditions. So with that, thanks again, everyone, for joining us. And Kristen, Kirby, I'll turn it over to you. Wonderful. Thanks, Julie. Um, I am so excited. I know Kirby and I have just been delighted and excited at the idea of getting to interview Josh um, in our community today. And I, I want to start off um and just share a little bit about josh's background i know that most of you are familiar with him and his work um but i, I i'm gonna give the the full the full story here in the you know four sentences that i have of his bio um and then josh i'm gonna ask you to share your purposeful journey so you can sure. be preparing your your data points for that okay. um so um dr josh Barron is co-founder and partner at banyan global he is the co-author of the Harvard Business Review Family Business Handbook. Looks like this. I like the um, product placement, thank you. I know, right? <laughs> um, for the last decade, he has worked closely with families who own assets together, such as operating companies, family foundations, and family offices. He helps these families to define their purpose as owners and to establish the structures, strategies, and skills they need to accomplish these goals. Josh is also an adjunct professor at Columbia Business School, where he teaches MBA courses on family business management and managing conflict in family business. He also teaches in the Enterprising Families Executive Education Program. Um, I know it's a little less fun to read someone's bio, but there's so much in here that I thought if I tried to go extemporaneously, I would miss some important data points. So, um, so Josh, thank you for being with us. We're so excited to have you. We have a robust conversation lined up ahead of us with some bonus content that we didn't even outline at the very beginning in our in our marketing blurb. Um, but before we could dive into that, I would love it if you would share your purposeful journey. How did you get to be where what you're doing? How did you get to be where you're at and what you're doing today? Right. Well, thank you, Kristen and, and Kirby and, and Julie and the team. It's such a it's such a great organization, and uh, I've heard a lot about it, and I'm delighted to be uh, welcomed here and, and invited here to talk to you. Um, I guess I would say that I wish I had a purposeful journey. Um, I feel like like a lot of things in life, uh, what I'm doing now is uh, in some ways an accident. Un unlike the relationships of families from the the purposeful quote, um, like a lot of folks you know, who, who don't work in a family business. I don't have to look far to find family businesses in my history. My great-grandfather started a furniture store. 
um, which my grandfather ran and then sold and did some real estate with my dad. But it wasn't anything that was really that directly part of my life and certainly not a career option. Um, my academic training actually is more in studying international relations. So basically, I, I studied war and conflict in that, that sense. And I always grew up fascinated by conflict. It was, and in particular, uh, by the, uh, the threat of nuclear war. I, um, I grew up in Denver. And if you ever watched, there were a ton of like nuclear war movies in the early 80s when I was kind of just starting to become aware of this stuff. And they always sort of NORAD, which is the big defense facility near Denver, was always on the list. So I just I used to I remember going to sleep when I was a kid, just being worried that I wouldn't wake up because of some conflict. And so I've always been fascinated by conflict. And one of the great things about this work is I've been able to take some of those lessons and bring them into the work with families. Uh, my career has always been a, I basically have been a consultant for my career. I started out. Uh, working for Bain and Company uh, in the U.S., I worked in Africa and Australia a bit, uh, working with large public companies and private equity firms and so on. And then I joined a spinoff of Bain called Bridgespan that works with large foundations and nonprofit organizations. And so, I really my first work with families was more around philanthropy, and um, I really enjoyed that. And so, I really just got connected to this world. Um, almost 15 years ago, I joined, um, just got, happened to meet someone who worked at a, not one of the original family business advisory firms. So I joined there, was there for a bit. And then about 10 years ago, uh, we spun off and created Banyan. And it's been a great journey since then. And it's uh, our, actually our 10th birthday is coming up in May, which is easy for me to remember. My twins are also having their 10th birthday in May. So that was <laughs> May, May of 2012 was a really busy time for me. Uh, but both the firm and the kids have turned out well so far. So I'm delighted about both. Yeah, well, I, I see that you're not afraid to like climb big mountains all at once. Huh? <laughs> yeah, it just kind of, yeah, it all happened. Uh, a little not, not all planned and expected in exactly that time, but it, everything kind of it all worked out. Yeah, I love it. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for sharing your journey to, to where you're at today. Um, I want to I wanna just frame up that the, the core content for our call is um, we're going to dive into some of the key uh, findings and um, ideas that, that Josh and Rob talk about in their HBR book. Um, but before we dive into that, we actually have some bonus content because on top of publishing this book, um, Josh and Rob also published a really interesting article in the Harvard Business Review. Um, it was July of, of last year, 2021. Um, and the title of it was, Do Most Family Businesses Really Fail by the Third Generation? And so um, Rob and Josh were looking at the, the sort of standard rule that we, for most of us, have been talking about in our industry for decades that there's this pretty predictable failure rate by the third generation in family enterprise. And so before we dive into the book content, you guys are going to get a twofer because we want to actually ask Josh a couple of questions about the article and, um, and what led them to, to really want to look at that, that ages old um, quote unquote rule. So um, Kirby, I'm going to turn it over to you so we can dive into the bonus content first. Yeah, bonuses are always welcome, right? <laughs> Especially when you don't even know you're getting one. So, um, and by the way, this was largely what inspired this session because Josh, I remember when that article was put out on social media, it created quite a buzz. I mean, you had um, hundreds, if not thousands of, you know, likes and comments flowing in and, you know, because you were really testing and challenging that assumption. So maybe you can just tell us a little bit more about sort of the, the background of that article and sort of what your key takeaways or thesis were to challenge, right? That, that short sleeves to short sleeves notion. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, look, I think the bottom line is, and I have to admit, I was guilty of this when I first started in the field. I think the whole, you kind of put up the data at the beginning of a meeting or a session or something like that. And it's a great scare tactic and, and motivating tactic in, in some ways. And um, what I've found in the you know, time that I've been working with families is that the, the negativity uh, and the negative perspective is really kind of taken over in a lot of ways. And I think that's a lot to do with with the media and the way that family businesses are talked about and discussed. And uh, 
you know, the, 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 the stories, both fictional, uh, you know, the successions and the Yellowstones and Dynasty in Dallas before that, um, family business feuds make for such great content that I think it's just natural in some ways that it's picked up by, um, you know, for these sort of stories and, and, you know, the stories we tell about family businesses in the news are almost all negative ones. And so, you know, really, I think the, the motivation behind that was to sort of say, well, that's interesting. I mean, it's clearly those, those things happen, but that's not really our experience uh, is mm-hmm. that families are kind of in this inevitable cycle of just waiting for everything to blow up. Um, and in fact, when you look at the trajectory of most family businesses, it's not this, you know, founder creates this incredible wealth and then second, third generation, you know, just sit on their laurels and do nothing. I would say the majority of the families that we have the privilege to work with, there's a founder that started something, oftentimes relatively small, and then it was some second, third, fourth, whatever generation entrepreneur that really turned this into into something. And so I think the real, the, the motivation was, you know, to really sort of understand and unpack that, those ideas. And there really are two ideas within the sort of what I would call the, the mythology around three generations. The first is this notion that family businesses fail by the third, you know, fail by the third generation. And honestly, the short version of that is, and you can read the article for more, if anyone's interested in more, is that, yeah, I mean, most business, family businesses aren't going to make it to, to three generations or through three generations, um, which is about, you know, 90 to 100 years, but most businesses don't. Um, you know, public companies don't last anywhere near that long on average, and their 10 years are getting shorter. Um, so all, all the data in some ways is really telling you is that it's really hard to make a business last for 100 years. But I think what it also people take that as is some sort of statement that there's something inherently wrong about family businesses. And in particular, there's something inherently wrong about one generation or the next. And that's where I think that this doesn't, the data doesn't tell us this. There's not actually great studies on longevity of companies. I've looked. The reason is because it's really hard to find companies that don't exist anymore. So all due credit to John (laughs) Ward and team who back in the 80s, went through the painstaking exercise of tracking down companies, Illinois manufacturing companies that don't exist anymore. It's really challenging. I give them a lot of credit for it. But we need to get out of the idea that just because most companies aren't going to make it that long, that therefore there's something inevitable about a family business in particular. And I think all the data that we have uh, suggests that you know, family businesses are better at longevity than other kinds. So that's sort of one side of it is the longevity question. And, um, you know, I don't think that that really supports some inevitable, there's something broken in family businesses. The other is the wealth one. I think this is when one where we actually have a really, a ton of information telling us this idea that on average, or most of the time that of shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations is just nonsense. Um, We can find the lottery winner, that, um, you know, they went broke afterwards. We can find that sort of, you know, the anecdote about the person who created a lot of wealth and then their kids were poor again. But on average, all the research suggests that wealth just doesn't dissipate anywhere near that quickly. And the, the ones that I've seen that have done a serious analysis on this would say, you're talking more like 10 to 15 generations. It does dissipate, it can dissipate, but we're not, the idea that it's gonna be gone in three generations is just not very likely. Um, you know, and so the anecdotes don't really aren't supported by the, the broader information set. And I think just getting away from this notion of, you know, I, I teach in an MBA class and I can't tell you almost every semester I have someone that stands up at the beginning, first day of class and says, I'm so-and-so, I'm from this place, I'm in the third generation, I'm the one that's going to screw up our family business. Like, mm. oh. it, it's not, it's not true, right? So we've created this sort of mythology, which builds into it not just a, a sense of negativity, but almost a self-fulfilling prophecy where families yeah. are sort of focused on, so focused on the negatives and the risks and the downsides and, and not enough on the things that you can actually do to avoid outcomes and, and change the course of it. Yeah. I'll step so down fear is a big motivator, that, right? Yeah. What's that? Yeah, Josh, fear, I said fear is a big motivator. So, I mean, that short sleeves or short sleeves, I think plays into a culture that wants like, they're only going to be galvanized by fear tactics, but I I tend to agree. I, I see far more families 
um, embracing sort of their heritage and celebrating it and using it as a strength and feeling proud to put that family owned label on their business, marketing. Um, and also I think there's a sense of pride that isn't quite the same when it's, you know, massive, um, publicly owned and sort of everybody owns it, nobody owns it, you know. So I, I, I do agree and, and certainly wealth will fractionalize as ownership fractionalizes, but it certainly endures a lot longer if the culture of the family thinks it should endure, right? That's right. And, and that's really what I, what I think, you know, look, it's not, I'm not trying to paint some sort of like rosy picture that this is easy. We all know that this is challenging. That's why this whole sector exists is to support families and going through the difficulties of integrating family dynamics and business and wealth decisions. Like it's hard. Um, but I just feel like the narrative has gone too far the other direction. I, I was talking to one family business a few years ago, and this is one that, you know, they had everything in place. They had a really connected family, um, in great business. The, this, these brothers had started it. We did an analysis of all the executives in the next generation, family and non-family. And it turned out that the next generation folks were like head and shoulders above everyone else. So like all the pieces are in place. And yet one of their board members who actually used to work at, at Bain & Company, won't call out his name, he had told them during a meeting that, you know, family businesses fail by the third generation. So if you want your business to last, which they did, you have to make a choice. You know, you have to take it out of the family's hands. And they were all set to do this uh, before we met them and said, oh, hold on to here. You know, like actually there's lots of great things that can come from a family business. And, and by the way, it looks like you all are pretty set up for success. And so it's just, I think, you know, we, and one of the things I found in family businesses is that there's a pendulum dynamic is that we swing from one end, you know, we have a bad experience with someone working in the company. And so we swing all the way over to the other side and say, okay, no one can work in the company, right? So I'm not suggesting we need to sort of go from, you know, the, the, the mythology of three generations to this is easy and every family business is going to make it. I just feel like we need to find something more of a middle ground that acknowledges the challenges without bringing such a negative defeatist attitude to it. Absolutely. And one of the things that I think um, that you and Rob point out in your article, and I think is a, a really important point, is this idea of looking for new data. What is the, what's the new, what, what is coming out that we, that we can, um, that maybe is more modern, better research design, that gives us more insight to what's really happening. And you guys talk about the, um, some of the work that's been done that illustrates that when you follow the family rather than the business, so following what does the family do, even if a business closes down, but they right. take that capital and they're redeploying it in new ways and investing in new companies. Like if you follow the family, you actually see much more significant success rates than, than when you just look at the business itself. And so there's, I think there's many factors that um, you know, as we think about professionalizing in our field and, and for our, our fellow PPI community members, if you, if you all remember back to Jim Grubman's 2019 keynote when he was talking about the, the Wealth 3.0 paradigm and what was necessary for us as a field to really mature and to the next level, one of the things that he talks about is the professionalization of our field and valid research. And I think that we're at a really important inflection point where we, where we need to start looking at some of the roots of, of what, what have we just continued. I can't tell you how many PowerPoint slides I have, shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves, the three generation or the 70% failure rate. I can't tell you how many PowerPoints that's embedded in that when I go to pull them out, I'm like, oh, now, well, what do I say instead that's compelling at the start of a presentation, which I think is one of the questions for our field, like what, where do we start turning our attention to, to move away from fear as a motivator to, um, to one, good data, and two, to the invitation of possibility. It doesn't mean it's not hard yeah. work. Um, one of the questions that, that I have, and, and then we'll, we'll pivot from, from the article and, and shift into um, to our book questions. Um, you know, as you were just talking a, a little bit about the, you know, what inspired you and Rob to look at that, that three generation rule. And um, we were talking about the need for um, valid data and moving away from a fear-based approach um, and perpetuating the message that families are destined to fail and family businesses are destined to fail. 
And I'm I'm curious from your position as a thought leader, Josh, what do you, as we consider how like what's the research that you know that industrious um, research practitioners need to be thinking of, and if we're moving into a an era where we can it could be the golden era of research for our field, yeah. what what do you think we need to have on our radar screen? What do we need to be gathering data on? That's a great question. Um, and I, I sort of, in some ways, I have one foot into the world of advising and one foot into the world of academics. And my, just to broadly generalize both and probably anger everyone who comes from both, <laughs> you know, the world of advising tends to focus more on the anecdotal example, right? This is, this is a family that had this experience or did this, one family did this. And the academic community is looking for things that you can demonstrate through, you know, scientific rigor and methods. Um, the challenge, there's a challenge in both approaches, obviously, the anecdote, you know, can be, you know, every family, business, office, whatever is different. And so the anecdote doesn't necessarily hold depending on the situation. On the flip side, there's just a really limited number of things that you can demonstrate through accepted, you know, peer review accepted uh, standards and the overlap between what you can demonstrate causally and what's useful in my experience is really small. And that just leaves a huge gap in between. And what I, that's really where I think, and I hope that we start to develop more as, as to, to pick up on Jim's term of professionalizing the field. Um, I don't think it's so much about best practices. I really shy away from that term. There are very few things that I think work well for every family in every situation, just because there are so many unique ways of doing it. I think getting into a deeper understanding of practices of saying like pick a topic, whether it's dividend policy or, you know, th thoughts about family employment or the evolution of the family enterprise, just cataloging and understanding the range of alternatives out there that families are doing and helping people to understand what are the pros and cons and implications. And so getting away from just the single anecdote and realizing the limitations of we can prove that this works and more creating a deeper understanding mm -hmm. of what are the choices that you have to make uh, or if you're advising what are the choices you have to help someone make what are the range of options and what are their implications um, i think there's a big gap there right now and um, i think it would really help to start to to narrow that as the field starts to get to the next level that's great that's hey, great Kristen, I, I just I want to jump in and just kind of go back to something that you brought up, but can you point us, Josh, a little bit to more of the research that, um, to your point, Kristen, when you're starting off and you say, I'm not going to do the short sleeves to short sleeves fear tactic, what, what research are you pointing to your families and to your peers also around, no, this is, this is really interesting stuff. I mean, there's socio-emotional socio wealth, which I can hardly get out of my mouth most of the time. Um, <laughs> there's just a lot of new um, research, but I'm just curious what you gravitate towards too. It's a great question. Uh, honestly, with families, not, I wouldn't say there's that much of the peer reviewed, re, you know, style research that, that they tend to find relevant. I think there are a few things that are useful and, and really partly it's, as I said, there's some good analyses that have been done about longevity of wealth that I think are, are useful. Um, there's some good analyses of, um, you know, success rates of family businesses, because sometimes families will come into a situation thinking that a family business, especially in the US, that a family business is just like a, a way station on the path mm -hmm. to becoming a real company, by which mm -hmm. we mean a public company. And those, so there's a lot of research showing that actually family companies perform better. Now, the problem with that research, like most research into success rates is, first of all, it depends on how you measure success. Is it short term, you know, stock price improvement or whatever? The bigger challenge is that what we're really comparing are family controlled public companies versus non family controlled public companies. And the reality is, is that most family companies are private and being private, they actually don't share their financial information. And so as an academic, it's almost impossible to get real information. Hmm. So I think there, there are, you know, there's some, there's, some there, there's been some good analyses on the, the, you know, the impact of not having succession plans in place you know, how that can negatively have a negative impact on, on the business performance. I honestly don't use those things. I think they can be good conversation starters and boundary yeah. sort of, un let's, let's counter a mythology if we need to, 
Um, but for the most part, you know, I don't really think that there's at this point enough of a of a base to say, you know, we actually need to build this on a scientific rigor. I think it's more about helping families to understand what are their what are their choices and what are the implications of those choices. Mm -hmm. Very and then I'll just be real, I'll be quick devil's advocate because I kind yeah, of feel please. that peer peer reviewed really matters to the academics, right? They need to have their peers validate that their research is rigorous and appropriate for you know the ivory um, journals sure. with That's... high impact ratings. At, at the end of the day. I don't know many family businesses that are really looking at journals and saying, oh, that impact rating, mm, not high enough. No. I won't read that. In fact, they're going to read one of your articles in HBR, or they're going to read something sure. that's much more inspiring, but they feel is practice driven. And I mean, I love that about PPI, that it is extraordinarily practice focused, which might be right, Christian, a good segue kind of to your book and why you wrote the book. Um, because again, I feel that that's what people really care about is help me, help my family, help this business endure. And what does that look like? And give me examples, give me tools, give me tips and direction. Yeah. Um, Cause I, I certainly know what I don't know. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you, Kirby. And I think that's a, a perfect tee up that maybe this would be a, a transition point. I, I will say to the, to the PPI audience, we will make sure that the, um, that Josh's article, Josh and Rob's article is posted in the, um, call summary notes so you guys will have access to that if you haven't already read it. Um, but so can you, Josh, can you just take a minute and frame up for everyone who doesn't have a copy right here on their desk where yeah. mine always is. It's like within arm's reach at every moment. Oh, thanks. Um, thanks could you just give us a, a, a frame up of um, sort of what's the what's the sharp end of the spear for this book? Why did why did you guys write it? What was the core point you're trying to get across? Yeah. I think why we wrote it, there are always multiple answers to that question. I think the, the primary reason is uh, because, you know, Rob and I have the great privilege to work with, you know, a number of family businesses, but we know that that number will always be limited. And we feel like we've learned some stuff that's valuable and we want other people to be able to, to use it, to apply it. Um, the other more practical reason is that uh, in general, when HBR asks you to write a book, uh, the answer is usually, <laughs> it's sort of like the, when you're, drill sergeant asked you to jump, the answer is how high, um, not, not yes or no. And that was kind of, I guess that's part of the other, the other element to the answer. And I think, you know, really the, you know, when I, when I joined this field, there was a, a I would say it, it was really built on, I would say a profound insight that in many ways shaped a whole multiple decades of work. Um, and that was the, the idea that in this thing called a family business, we should actually pay attention to the family part of it. And so we need to develop the family, we need to organize the family, we need to connect the family. Um, and all these approaches about family councils and family constitutions, it's amazing, almost no matter where I go in the world, people have understood and taken these concepts, which is a great success. Um, what we found in our work uh, with, with, with families, especially sort of large, significant family businesses and family enterprises, is that that's really important. So in no way, this is in, in addition to not instead of, is that we're not always focusing enough on what is arguably the most important role of the family, which is to serve as the owners of this enterprise. And I just believe that ownership is probably the most important, least discussed topic in the business world. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, teaching in a business school, we, we don't teach ownership other than specialized classes on family business, on private equity, we don't really talk about ownership. And the reason is because the entire you know, business world is built around the idea of a public company. And in a public company, the owners don't get to do very much. You can go to an annual meeting, you can sign a proxy statement. I've never, never done either of those things uh, for any of the companies that I'm invested in. Um, but ownership is just, it doesn't really have a real meaning or depth to it in the context of a public company. But those are the companies that are studied because that's where you get peer reviewed articles and so on is you study companies that have data and that's all that is available. And because of that, I think we've actually brought to the study of business uh, a really impoverished view of what ownership means. And so I like to think of ownership if you, you know, of something that you own like 
your car or your house. Like, what does ownership mean there? Well, it means that you basically get to make almost every choice of significance about it. Like, you know, who can visit your house? You know, if you want to rent it out, if you want to sell it, if you want to paint it, if you want to put a pool in the backyard, like almost everything of significance, um, you know, you get to make those choices. And by the way, because you live in that house, you're pretty invested in how, what it feels like. And so you're interested in those choices. And that's a much better analogy for family businesses than a public company, because mm -hmm. In a family business, um, the owners are, you know, it's a relatively small number of people, even if it's a few hundred, that's relatively small compared to the owners of a large company. And instead of being investors in like thousands or hundreds of thousands of a diversified portfolio, you're invested like in this business. And I mean that literally, probably in many cases, 90% around of your wealth is tied up into this thing. And when you put those two together, you get a view of ownership that's just fundamentally different. And so understanding what ownership means, um, how you activate it, how you be effective as an owner, I think is really one of the central questions for the long-term success or lack thereof of, of family enterprises. And so what Rob and I and you know, our firm have really developed over the last 10 years is a whole methodology of thinking about and understanding what ownership means and, and how you do it. What are the choices? What are the implications? How do you organize yourselves as a family to be effective in this role as the owners of the company? That's great. I love it. I love it. Don't you love it, Kristen? I love it. I love it. Hey, well, speaking of ownership, and again, I, I'm, I will beat my drum and agree with you, Josh, that ownership is, it's like, the food desert, right, of family business. Ooh. There's that, you know, there seems to be opulence and a lot of resources and research everywhere, but no one does really deeply go into that. And I want to pick up on something that is really unique to your book. Um, you talk about the five core rights. Maybe you can unpack that for us a little bit. Yeah. And what are these rights? Why do they impact family business longevity? Why do they matter so much? Great. And, and I'll actually, I, I'll pull up a graphic so you can see it. I'm a visual person, so I'm always sympathetic to those that can't listen to someone drone on uh, for more than 30 <laughs> seconds. That happens to be me. Um, but, but really, the core insight is going back to what does ownership mean? And at its essence, owning something means that you have the right to do something that no one else can do without your permission. Like that's, that's the essence of what it means to own anything, car, house, business, et cetera. And so what we kind of came to is this idea that the basis, the base, you know, the fundamental aspect of ownership are these rights that the owners of the business have that create choices uh, that they make and no one else makes unless they give over that permission. And, and there really are five main rights that come with ownership. And I'll show you here. This is what, can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. So these are the five core rights. And I'll just give you sort of like a 30 second sketch on, on each of them. And then we can kind of come back or go deeper into any of them. I'll kind of just work my, uh, my way kind of around, around the wheel. The first right is to design. And think about that as kind of architecting the family business. And you can think about, you know, or enterprise. What do we own together? Is it an operating company? Is it a series of operating companies? Is it operating companies and a family office, a foundation? What's the scope? You know, what do we, what do we want to have together as a family? And you'll see, you know, all kinds of different versions or, or, or variations of that answer. Within that, then who gets to be an owner? You know, and, and almost every family enterprise is built on exclusion when it comes to ownership. Mm -hmm. Anyone who's not a descendant, you know, is usually not allowed. You know, spouses rarely allowed, sometimes, but rarely allowed to be to be owners. And employees sometimes, but rarely. And usually, in those cases, it's the contingent kind of ownership. You can be an owner as long as as long as you're here, and then when you leave, that's it. Um, but some families actually go further than that and actually connect ownership, not just to where you're born, but to participation in the business. Mm -hmm. Like you have, to, you have to work in the company in order to be eligible to be an owner, right? So where, where do you fall on that? And then within that group of ownership, how do you, how do you share control? You know, if I own, if I own 20% of the business, does that may not have 20% of the voting rights? That's how it works in some families. In others, they actually share the economic value of the company, but they put one person or maybe a couple people in charge of the control. 
And there's some very significant family businesses that that work like that, where there's one, you know, one person that has the authority. One of the examples we cite in the book is Vitamix, which has a, a you know, the, the economic value of the ownership passes through the descendant lines. Um, but a one person in the family, the CEO, has a supermajority of the voting shares. And so they try to work for consensus, as most families do, but if they can't find it, then there's someone who um, has the ability to make the ultimate, you know, ultimate call. So those are design questions, just architecting this. What, what kind of a family enterprise do we want? Then we get into questions about the side, you know, like how do you make decisions, right? And in the early, you know, the owners can make every decision that they, you know, if they want to, from the strategy of the business to the color scheme on the walls and everything in between. Um, but of course, as the business gets larger, the family gets larger, that's impractical. And so you have to think about, you know, how do you, you know, how do you delegate and, and getting into that world of governance? And so what are the structures that you need to make decisions? Um, what kind of processes do you need spelling out in advance? How do we make controversial decisions rather than just doing them on an ad hoc basis? And then what talent do we need actually to fill out and do this work effectively, both within the family and, and outside the family? The third right is the right to the right to value that, you know, when I when I worked for Bain and Company, we never had to ask our clients how they define success. It was we knew it. It was whatever decision would help them to increase, you know, their shareholder returns was the right decision. Um, when it comes to a family enterprise, one of the great things about it is that they get to decide what success means for themselves. Um, it doesn't it can be financial success. In most cases, most families that I've worked with. That's usually only one element and often not the most important one. They may be thinking more about longevity and legacy and family uh, relationships and harmony and opportunity and social responsibility. It's oftentimes a, a complex stew of how you define success. Um, but actually going through the process of saying, you know, what's the purpose for owning this enterprise? What's the why? Why are we doing this together is really critical. And then being specific and translating that high level sense of why into specific things about what do we want? What are our goals? What do we want more of and less of? And how do we build guardrails that help us take those aspirations and turn them into things that we can actually know whether we're on track or off track. Then the fourth right is the right to inform. If you're the owner of a business, you actually in most cases and most jurisdictions have the legal right to information that no one else you know, has that legal right. And so the owners actually sit on this pile of knowledge about the financials of the business and the succession plans and even who owns it. Um, and I think there's oftentimes a tendency in families, you know, they're private companies for a reason. They don't want to tell anyone what's going mm -hmm. on, right? But of course, you know, there's value to that in some cases. But if you hold on to things too tightly, you're, you're missing the opportunity to get the benefits that come from good communication. And so really thinking about as a family, how do you exercise this right to control information flow? What, do you, what should you keep to yourselves? What should you share with spouses, with the next generation, with your employees or out in the public? And being thoughtful about those choices. Um, and as you get larger about what, you know, you know, communication tends to happen over the dinner table at the beginning, but as you get into that second, third, fourth generation, you actually need to be thoughtful, not just about what's shared, but do you have the right infrastructure in place to share it. And then the last right is the right, we call the right to transfer. If you own something, you did get to decide what happens next. You know, does it go to the next generation? Do you sell it? Um, at what time? And, you know, we tend to think of um, transition planning sometimes, you know, for those of you who've seen The Lion King, there's like the, the Simba model of succession. Like, <laughs> I need to find my successor and then I'm done. So like, you know, and when the, when the father holds up his son, Simba, and says like, you're you're the next ruler of, 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 of the realm. Uh, and sorry to spoil if you haven't seen The Lion King, it doesn't work out so well. <laughs> and it doesn't work out so well in family businesses when someone just sort of says, here's the next CEO, everything is done. And as you all know, there's a whole range of things that you have to think about when it comes to trans, you know, transferring a business down. You know, how do you pass the assets down in a way that's responsible? How do you hand off key roles, not just business leadership, but also board leadership and family leadership and so on? Um, and then how do you build the capabilities next generation to be able to step into these different roles that you want them to play? And so, you know, as you kind of tell, as we walk through these five rights, we've touched on, you know, a whole bunch of things. And when you add them up, they're 
most of the things that end up mattering. And I think the families that do a good job of thinking carefully about these choices, being explicit about them, um, you know, adapt, you know, adapting to changes in the environment as they're making those choices do pretty well over time. And those that are less focused on, on doing this work of ownership well uh, tend, tend to struggle, tend to suffer. So that's really the, the basic insight is that through the exercise of these, of these rights comes you know, the, the ability to have a, a family business that sustains and successful over time. Um, and then not doing that work is really the thing that causes families to get, to get, into, that, to get into trouble. Yeah, I, I love the, like, I'm really glad you displayed the graphic. That would have been an immense amount of information to try to just capture through, yep. <laughs> through uh, audio. <laughs> but, um, and, and what I love is, is how in, through, your, um, through your guys' thinking, you have simplified what are many complex decisions, processes, and made it so you can, you can just more easily tackle a, a section at a time or some key areas in each section. Um, so in, in that same, same uh, frame, one of the things that you guys did in your, in your book and in your thinking that I think is another place where there's a simplification that is, that is very powerful is the four room model. So yeah. you, you talked a little bit ago about ownership of a house being more akin to, um, to what it's like for owners of a business than owners of a business to a, a public business, right? Like there's, yeah. it's more personal, it's more relevant. Um, and I'm so I'm curious if you could, if you would just share with us a little more about the four room governance model that you guys have created. Absolutely. And that's kind of building out that notion of decide, of decide, like, you know, how do you actually make decisions as things get more complicated? And, and Kristen, as you were saying, the, the house analogy kind of continues because just like the intuition behind the four rooms is just like, you know, in your home, you make different decisions. You do different work in the kitchen where it's like, what's for dinner versus the living room where it's what's on Netflix. In a family business, you have different kinds of decision decisions you uh, you, you do different kinds of work. And, and really what we think about is there's really four different kinds of, of decisions that happen in a family business. Um, and there's a relationship in how they work. And so I'll, uh, I'll share my screen again, just so you can get the visual of the four room model. I'll kind of walk you quickly through it. Um, so the first room is the management room and that's where you run the business or whatever, family office, foundation, on a day-to-day -day basis, it's where you're making, you know, hundreds or thousands of decisions about pricing or new products or investments or whatever. I mean, it's the, the place where you're running the thing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, then above that, we have the boardroom. And the boardroom is where you're thinking about the strategy. Where are we going over the next three to five years? You're thinking about succession planning, about, you know, evaluating the talent. Who should be the CEO of the business? Are they doing a good job? How do we compensate that person? Um, when there are big business decisions, you know, a big investment or acquisition or divestiture, um, you know, we, we want to sort of take a step back from the day-to-day -day operations and, and put ourselves into the boardroom. Um, and then we have the owner room. And in the owner room, we're making a relatively small number of really important foundational decisions. There are things like, do we want to stay private or go public? Um, you know, who do, are there certain things we won't do? even though they might make us more money because they're against our values. So there's one um, family that is in the chemical industry and they've said, you know, we can make a lot of money selling to cigarette manufacturing mm. companies, but we're not going to do that. That's off the table, you know, mm. for the management team because it's counter to our values. Um, in the owner room, you're actually thinking about who should sit on the board. And that's one of the roles of the owners is to select select the board. And so this is a hierarchy. The management ultimately you know, is selected by and, and answers to the board. The board is ultimately selected by and, answer, and answers to the owners. Um, and then we have the, the family room, um, which is deliberately not part of the, the structure of deci you know, decision making about the business. The family room is the place where we're thinking about really important things like how do we stay connected to each other as a family? Um, how do we develop talent so people can step into those different rooms? They're prepared to be good owners or directors or good managers. And there might be some of the family assets that might be just as important or even more important from a legacy perspective, um, even though they're not, uh, don't have the same economic value. So the vacation home, which causes 
might be worth 2% of the, of the value, but 99% of the conflict comes from there, right? right? So that oftentimes there's some family assets that are really important and are managed in the family room. And so the idea of the, of the four rooms is really to use it as a structure to ask these questions. Do we have the right places, the right forums to, to do the work that's required? Do we have the right, um, do we need a board of directors or a board of advisors? Do we need a family council or an owner council or a family meeting? Um, do we have the right places to do that work? And you know, oftentimes this happens more informally in the early stages of a family business. Um, but as we get further along, we require a little bit more formality to kind of to do that work and to be inclusive. The second thing is, do we have the right you know, processes? Do we have the right decision-making, you know, uh, way, ways of handling tough decisions? Like something like making a, a dividend distribution decision that you know, affects the management room, it affects the board, the owner room, the family members. How do we construct decisions so that they flow well and don't cause more conflict than, than is necessary? Um, do we have the right agreement so that if, you know, most families or many families operate by handshake, um, they probably, they may have a shareholder agreement, but I can guarantee you that no one's read it in 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they think that everything works a certain way. And as, you know, as long as everyone agrees, that's fine. But that kind of more informal approach works perfectly well up until the moment where it doesn't work at all. So making clear that actually the agreements, the, the shareholder agreement, the buy, sell, so on, that those actually, they work the way that you think that they do. And then lastly is the talent question. You know, do we have the right people, you know, in our you know, family and non-family in the management room, boardroom, um, and so on. And so really thinking about governance as through the lens of each of these places being incredibly important. And when, when any of these rooms is missing or messy, then the whole thing just doesn't work well, right? Mm -hmm. So understanding where are, you know, what's, what's, what's highly functional, what's missing, and then how do we start to put in place, uh, answer some of these questions to make sure that the whole governance architecture is kind of working as intended. So that's, that's the four room model. That's fabulous. I love, I love it because it, again, simply addresses ownership, management, and leadership. Those are like really the three components that constitute governance and planning considerations. And your graphic really nicely starts to orient. You can see sort of, okay, the management bucket, if we have a retiring family or non-family president, if we have, um, and you know, your board room could also be a board of advisors. It might yes. not be a formal, right? Um, and I like your family room because the family room could have a little side family council room or it could have the next gen, you know, board that's Absolutely. coming up for something. So I, I like the construct because it actually can still be further um, morphed and specified, right? Back to yeah. let's size to the family we're working with. Let's not just um, think about, you know, this has to be only this way. So I think it's genius, Josh. You and oh, Rob thanks. really. This, this is Thank a you. this is a keeper for every advisor out there. You should definitely be looking at this as as a tool that will be incredibly helpful. We've definitely found that in our work is it it just helps to get a good conversation started. And and I think you're entirely right that it scales up and down. And I was working with one group of siblings that had lunch every day together and. Over lunch, they discuss like very tactical business issues. They discuss where they're going on vacation. They would discuss like how much you know dividend to pay out. They discuss like family drama, and the conversation would just swirl around and around. And just by saying like hold hold, hold on, why don't we just use this structure instead of say okay, you know sometimes you're going to meet and you're going to have management discussions. And by the way, you should probably include your non-family folks in that conversation because they have something to say there too, right? And then. Once a you know, quarter, get together and just have a, a board conversation where you're thinking about the strategic issues. And you know, maybe you should think about having some, some others who aren't part of your family to help you make those decisions. And then you should have the owner discussions and then the family discussions. By the way, you should probably include the spouses when you're thinking about where to plan the vacation, right? So even if it's a relatively small, tight-knit group where there's not a lot of distinction in roles where everyone's wearing all of the hats, just using it as a discipline to sort of say, are we having 
the right conversations with the right people at the right frequency rather than just swirling around. And then as you get into bigger, more complicated families, Kirby, you're exactly right. You know, what do we need in each of these rooms? Do we need a family council, a family meeting, a next gen group, an owner council, or you know, a shareholder meeting, board of directors? All of these things you can you can build it out, but still make sure that they stay connected and clear. Um, and, and actually, one of the things that we oftentimes use as like a, a meeting ground rule with families is we call it stay in the right room, mm -hmm. which is, you know, like we're this is an owner meeting, like if we're getting down deep into business stuff. We, we've left that we've left the owner room we're getting into the manager. That's not our job here today. So it can just be a good discipline for people to have, you know, have constructive dialogue on, on the variety of things that come up as part of being in a family business. Absolutely agree. So helpful. Um, I know I want to make sure that we have time for questions and I'm betting given the number of attendees we have and, and the, um, the critical thinking, intelligent people who are in this group, there's probably a, more questions than we have time for. But before we transition to that, um, I wanted to just ask you, Josh, if you would talk about your, you have very generously been willing to share an assessment that's part of a toolkit that goes, yeah. um, that is associated with the book. Um, we, we will send out this assessment as part of the follow-up. One thing that, um, that I will ask everybody that we're not, we, because it is part of a bigger toolkit, we won't post it in the, the materials for the call. We will send it out as a part of the follow-up call notes so you all have it, but please take it and use it with the gift that it, as, as it's been given and not then shared out in other places. Um, because this is something that I think is a, a phenomenal assessment and something really useful for all of us to think about, um, but is the IP for th that goes with the, the book and is part of something bigger. Yeah, so you know, one of the uh, one of the things that HBR asked us to do as part of the kind of addendum to the book is to create a toolkit so that people can actually apply it to themselves or you know, with an advisor and actually take some of the ideas and put them into practice. And so this is, as Kristen, you said, this is one of the tools. I think there's like 15 of them that are part of that that toolkit. And this one is in particular about a subject that I'm I really love talking about, which is this idea of owner strategy. It goes down to that the middle of those five rights, the third one, which is sort of like, how do you define success? And what I've noticed in my work is that very often we talk at a very high level of abstraction about what success means. We do the mission statement, uh, we do the values, which are really, really important, not to diminish those at all, but there's a huge gap between that high level aspiration and practical business decisions. And what we've seen happen is that when that gap is not closed, then the board or the management team either have to you know, ask you, what do you want as owners? By the way, I think that's the single best indicator that you have a good board is that they ask the question of the owners, mm. what do you want? Um, or the, the worst version of this is that they try to fill in the gaps for themselves. And so the work of owner strategy is basically to say, you know, what is our purpose? But then how do we translate that into, how do we think about trade-offs? You know, what do we want more of? What do we want less of? And then building that into guardrails, which are ways of actually measuring whether we're getting what, we're, what we want. Those can be financial things like a maximum debt to equity ratio or a minimum you know, return on investment threshold. Or they could be non-financial um, things like their environmental footprint or employee loyalty or things like that. And actually going through the exercise of, of sort of saying, what do we want and how do we know if we're getting there can be incredibly powerful uh, for families. And the tools designed to kind of help spur and encourage that conversation. That's gonna be great. So we will send that out um, so everybody has access to that. And I would encourage you if you haven't, um, if you haven't actually gone out and, and bought this book yet, I would highly encourage everyone on this call to buy it. And it's it's so well done. And um, and just the way that you've experienced Josh here today, taking really a lot of complexity and moving from from to the far side of complexity and to the powerful side of simplicity. I think that that Josh and Rob's book does that as well. Um, so if this is content that's that's really had you leaning in, um, I think that there's a lot more for you in their resource. So yeah, I'll I'll, I'll echo that. It's it's accessible. It's well written. Um, it's not over. I mean, sometimes there's so many sites, I'm guilty of that, but um, I think you did a really good job of smartly packing a lot of content into um, a, 
a good amount of pages, but not too, too many pages. So I think it was extraordinarily, it's a great, it's a great handbook. It's definitely one for the bookshelves. Not even, I wouldn't even say e-reader because I like to dog ear my book too. Yep. Agreed. Um, so we have, a, we have a couple of minutes. We have seven minutes, which is, um, you know, great time for, for questions. Um, I think, I can't remember if we have the, do we have the ability to raise hands on this? We do. Okay. Yep. So maybe that's the, the most effective way. If someone has a question, um, to go ahead and raise your hand and, and Julie can make sure that your line gets unmuted. Um, I'm, I don't see any immediately. And, um, so while you guys are thinking of your questions, let me just give you a, a moment. Kirby and I can tee up another, uh, we have so many, like if you guys could see our interview guide, like we have as many questions in the parking lot for just in case as we had in the main guide. So and I think we could go another hour. Steve, Kristen has his hand raised, Steve Lakler. Hi guys, uh, as we alluded to before we started recording, I said it was really great to have someone talking about family business with the PPI group, which is more in the family wealth space. So I just wonder if you could help us bridge the work you've done with family businesses towards a lot of the families that are further along and maybe have divested of the business and they're more concerned with just the family wealth issues. And how does that, these ownership, these five ownership rights affect those families? It's a great question, Steve. I mean, I, I've, I've tried, I know this from, from trying it out, I think it works quite well um, because whether it's a family that has an operating company that's at the center or some other vehicle that helps them to manage that wealth, whether it's a family office or a family investment company um, or a family foundation or sort of some combination of the above, I think the same set of questions are, are applicable. It, they, they tend to play out in slightly different ways, like governance in the family office uh, is, you know, you can still put it in the four rooms. The structures look a little different. Um, you have investment companies and, and things like that, uh, sorry, investment committees and things like that. But the fundamental aspects of, of walking through these choices and understanding, you know, what do we want to own together and who's allowed to participate and what decisions we want to keep for ourselves versus delegate to others and how do we know if we're successful or not and, and on and on. I think the same type of questions can actually help to, you know, to, to open up a great dialogue inside of a, a family that's more in the, the world of wealth and the world of operating companies. That's been my experience, at least. I think theoretically, I agree with everything you just said. I just feel that somehow when there's an operating business, the occasions to talk more frequently about these things are more there. Yeah. And often in, in families where it's just the wealth and then they have these family office people who are doing all this stuff and managing the wealth, often the family gets even more disjointed from the wealth. And so sure. it becomes even an even bigger challenge. It, it does, Steve. And, and I think there's, you know, one of the things that's, that I think it, it can be harder to get the conversation going because the business creates a sense of gravitational pull to it, right? And the family office might not have that same level of, of pull on it. At some level, that becomes even more important for these conversations to get started because there's always, the, you know, a family business is not impossible, but not easy to disassemble and to pull apart and go your own separate ways. In general, a, a wealth pool is pretty easy to do that. You can each, you always have the option of just taking your mo money to insert multifamily office or, or uh, you know, or, or, or private wealth manager here, right? And so actually having those conversations about why are we doing this together and, you know, thinking about these different, you know, questions of policy and so on become, I think, even more critical. And the nice thing about it is the flip side of a family business having, that more gravitational pull is that it's also more of a one size fits all solution. You either own it or you don't own it. Um, whereas in a wealth environment, you can create things that are much more uh, varied and flexible and creative where maybe we wanna do some things to get, maybe all of us wanna do some things together, 
some of us want to do other things together and so on. And so I've actually worked with families to sort of take some of these lenses and build, build structures that actually are going to be more sustainable because they are more flexible and responsive to the evolving needs of the family. So I agree with you. It's maybe hard to get these conversations going. Um, they're just as important and, and, and have a different flavor and character to them. I don't know if that makes sense or not. Yeah, it makes, it makes, it makes a lot of sense. And between the gravitational pull of the family business, Kirby's reference to ownership being the food desert of the family business world, <laughs> and Kristen's cute little puppy behind her. I've got the trifecta here. Thanks, all of you. Always a clown. Steve, that, was, there, that one is. Steve, that was great. That was a great question. I know we had one question from Jim Grubman come in on just, he loved your practical approach. Any other metaphors or images or anecdotes you can share with us that we might find helpful that maybe you, one more teaser for the book. Um, people are buying it, by the way. Um, uh, a lot of yeah. us are. Good, so. I'll, I'll give you just a, a quick one. It's, it's actually from this. I teach this class on managing conflict in family business. And the title is Managing Conflict because I think sometimes we get into this mode of, of thinking we need to avoid conflict. Um, and basically the metaphor is you probably all know the, the Goldilocks uh, fairy tale with the too much, too little, uh, just right. Um, or if you think about how astronomers talk about the earth as not being too close to the sun or too far away, there's kind of that zone in the middle. Um, I think that's a really helpful way to think about conflict in a family business. Uh, one of the things I have my students do in class is we talk about what are the impact of too much conflict and too little conflict on the business or the enterprise and on the family. And what they discover by doing that is that the impact is actually basically identical. Mm. That too much conflict and too little conflict have almost the same long-term effects, different mechanisms, same long-term effects on the viability of the enterprise and the relationships of the family. And so just the, the work I think in a family and to a large extent is learning to find that middle zone. And as I said, you know, at the beginning, our tendency in families is to pendulum swing, to go from one extreme to the other, whereas a lot of it's about finding that space in the middle, you know, not too much, not too little. Well, I know we're right at the top of the hour. We maximized our time. I'm really <laughs> proud of us. I think we fit in more content than I, like juicy content than I've ever fit in before. So Kirby, thank you. Josh, thank you. This has been um, an absolute delight. Yeah, Thank it was so wonderful, Josh. It. Thanks so much for your time. My pleasure. I enjoyed it. And Julie, we'll turn it over to you. Yes, well, thank you everyone for joining us today. And thank you, Josh, Kirby, and Kristen for an amazing session. 